Welcome to the lecture on Fairness, Accountability, Transparency and Ethics in Machine Learning. This FATML or FATML is a term commonly used. I won't be able to cover all these topics because they're really courses on their own, right? The whole issue of transparency or the whole issue uh, of ethics, they would be entire master's programs. But I'd really like to give you a short overview on how these things relate to data science and why they're relevant for you as a data scientist. I'd like to quickly start with the Turing test. You probably have heard about this by now, but let's just recap what it's about. The basic idea or the basic question that Turing wanted to answer is whether machines can think. And in one of his papers, he invented the so-called Turing test as a test to check whether a machine is thinking or not. And he based this on the so-called imitation game. So here on top you have two people who pretend to be a certain person and you have the person on the bottom who has to guess who that person is. The people can lie and they only communicate in text. So basically people can ask questions like what's the length of your hair? What's the color of your hair? So based on these answers the person on the bottom decides who is real and who's just pretending to be the person. And Turing basically proposed having one of these people giving the answers being a machine, a computer. And he said that if the person on the bottom cannot reliably tell the machine from the human, the machine is said to have passed the Turing test, right? Because it really behaved like a human. So it's a basically a definition of intelligence based on behavior. And Turing also stated that the test result does not depend on the machine's ability to give correct answers, but is only evaluated on how closely its answers resemble those a human would give. You can Google it, there are quite a lot of chatbots that get very, very close, but pause the video, play a bit with these chatbots, and then think whether you believe that this is actually a good test of intelligence or not. I'm going to provide you with one famous critique. And this is by John Seale. And he made an argument and a thought experiment that's commonly known as the Chinese room. And in a way, he imagines himself alone in a room following a computer program for responding to Chinese characters slipped under the door. So there's this Chinese room, he's in the middle, and he gets these characters. He understands nothing of Chinese, and yet, by following the program and by manipulating symbols and numerals, just like a computer would do, he sends appropriate strings of Chinese characters back out under the door. And this then leads those outside the room to think that he's actually speaking Chinese. So the narrow conclusion of the argument is that in programming, you can make it appear to understand language, but you cannot really produce a real understanding. And that's why Seal thinks that the Turing test is inadequate. Seal argues that the thought experiment underscores that computers merely use syntactic rules to manipulate symbolic strings. But they don't have any understanding of the semantics. So he makes the argument that in a way there's a huge difference between actually understanding and faking to understand. And we will see this again and again with machine learning systems. They might look powerful but they are just very good at imitating certain things. And for many applications, that's fine. But for other applications, it's really not okay. And my ambition is to teach you to make that distinction, right? To find the ones where it's okay to apply machine learning and to find the ones where it's really not appropriate. Overall, when considering fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics in machine learning, you should consider the following aspects and this is a very nice overview by Daryl Ware. So first and foremost you should consider the objective and the impact. Who is actually affected by a system and how? And this includes asking yourself how the roles of the actors and their relationships to each other are changing due to this machine learning system or any kind of information system. You should also consider how the decision making processes are changing. And you should consider whether the value proposition of the system can be delivered. There's a tool called the value proposition canvas. I won't go into much detail on it in this lecture, but Google it. It's very good as a tool for this. 
and also in the slides on the bottom you find more information. Then you should consider inclusion and fairness. Think of who is excluded, who is included by the system, and can there be a bias that can be identified? Then consider trust and transparency. So are the decisions of the system transparent? Do people trust the decisions? And how can the system actually learn? And there's security and privacy. So is the collected data stored securely? Is privacy respected? These are all issues that really don't feel like core machine learning issues, but they're very, very fundamental to the application of machine learning in practice. We also have to think, of course, about the societal consequences of these tools. Here's a consideration of how artificial intelligence might affect unemployment. It's from the book AI Superpowers by Kei Fu Lee. Very good book. I can also recommend that. And what you see here is two dimensions, one going from asocial to social and one from low dexterity and a structured environment to high dexterity and an unstructured environment. And we're looking at which of the physical labor jobs are at risk of being replaced by artificial intelligence and robotics. And you can see that, for instance, restaurant cook, fast food preparer and the danger zone, they're likely to be replaced, whereas something like the caretaker of elderly people is quite in the safe zone because it's a very social job, deal with people, and it's a very unstructured environment. A lot of things can happen. And in the following, we can also consider the same chart for cognitive labor. Here again, we distinguish between asocial and social. On the left, we have tasks that are based on optimization, and on the right, we have tasks that are based on creativity or strategy based problem solving. And you can see in the safe zone, people like a psychiatrist, a social worker, and the CEO of a company, they probably won't be replaced by AI anytime soon. Whereas things like telemarketer or insurance adjuster are at much higher risk to be replaced. Something like scientist or columnist are on this slow creep. So there could be advances in AI that actually make a difference and replace them but it's not going to happen anytime soon. And there are other things that, again, have this social dimension, which make it highly unlikely that they're going to be um, replaced. And note that this is also true for teachers and doctors, because it's all about the relationship between the people, about understanding people, encouraging them, empowering them, and that really can't be done by a machine. So when looking at these quite powerful techniques, we also have to consider abuses or misuses. So the potential usage of such machine learning tools in military is obvious, but there's also the risk of surveillance capitalism through companies like Google and Facebook or applications like the social crediting scores that we see here in the slide. And in a way that's really datafication, right? Everything a person does is recorded, is turned into data, and then we make predictions about that. But of course, we always have to ask, is this really what we want? Is this the society that we want to live in? And maybe we want to be more than just a simple number, than a simple score. So Langdon Winner poses this question of whether a bridge can be raised. And I would really like you to pause the video a bit and think about that. Like why would a bridge, that's just something you drive over, you walk over, um, be racist and how? So maybe take a quick break, think about that for a second. And now I'm going to tell you what he was referring to. So this example comes from a famous essay called Do Artifacts Have Politics? An artifact in this context means just anything made by humans. So can something like a bridge have politics. And in this example, he refers to the bridges in Long Island in New York. Because the bridges there were deliberately set low. And Winner argues that they embody classicist and racial discrimination. Because since the bridges were so low, only people with cars could get to the beach and into the park. Which means that the 
public park and the beaches were kept from the poor people who had to take the bus because the bus couldn't pass these bridges. And that effectively just kept colored people from going to the beaches and from going into the park. Algorithms, just like any other technology, have certain worldviews and certain ideas inscribed into them. So in this example, I want to consider the error cases that a machine learning system can make. And we have two dimensions here. We have the output of our system and the reality. And if our output and the reality both correspond, right, then we have so-called true positives and true negatives. And if they don't, we have the false positives and the false negatives. So false positives is that our system is predicting something to be true, while that's not the case, a person having cancer, um, which doesn't have it. And false, false negatives are cases in which our system predicts that something is not true, while it actually is true. And it's important to do this kind of error analysis and it's also important to consider what these errors mean for different kind of people. Let's consider the example of cancer detection that we had before. So here we had the false positive, and that was predicting that a healthy patient has cancer. And in the first lecture, I told you that this has consequences like additional testing, additional cost, and potentially mental distress. Whereas false negative, that is predicting an ill patient has no cancer. So making an error in this regard is far more serious because here we can cause serious health issues and potentially even death. So if we do an assessment here, we say in green the things that we want, right? True positives and true negative, that, that's the idealized system performance. And if we make a false positive, if we test a person and tell them that they have cancer, that's not as bad as predicting that somebody who has actually cancer doesn't have it. And I'm going to show you now a variety of examples because it's not always like that. Let's consider, for instance, spam filtering. Here, a false positive is an email that is marked as spam and deleted. And the consequences of that is that we're losing some important work mail or emails from close friends whereas false negatives are spam mails that end up in our mailbox. And the consequence of that is that it's annoying. So here's the other way around, right? So here it's a false positive of the system um, that's really, really bad, and um, a false negative that's merely annoying. Let's consider another example. Let's think about Netflix and video and movie recommendations. So here the false positive would be providing a recommendation that a user does not like. And the consequences of that is that a user wastes his or her time and that we might lose trust in the system. The false negatives are not recommending a movie even though the user would like it. And the consequences of that is that the user might miss out on something. So here again the false positives are much worse than the false negatives although that can depend on the different users. Now a final example, and that's fraud detection. In fraud detection, for instance, credit card fraud, false positives might be legitimate transactions that are blocked. And that again can be annoying because it might waste time for some people because they have to sort it out. But false negatives, that is fraudulent transactions that are allowed, can have far worse consequences that are quite catastrophic because a user might lose a lot of money. So here again, we have a distribution like this. And I'm showing you this to really give you a feeling to really think about the error cases of your system. Let's reconsider the cancer detection example. The reality is even more complex. Now, I gave you this nice dichotomy, right? We have always people with cancer, people without cancer, but there's a lot more to it. So if you consider the example on detecting breast cancer, you remember that we had information about the cancer, 
for instance, the mean number of concave points and the mean area in pixels. And then we try to find this decision boundary to be able to mathematically decide this is cancer, this is not cancer. What I didn't tell you yet is that the separating boundary might be different for different subgroups in your data. So we might end up in a situation where we make very good decisions for the majority because we're dealing with statistics and we're looking at what's the most likely thing while doing quite poorly for minorities. So if we look at the population in the data on the top right here, we find that uh, we could do two decision boundaries. The one on the top left is really good for the majority group, but if we take that and look at the data points from the minority group, we would make terrible decisions. We would just not be better than chance. And as you can see, the decision boundary for the minority is very, very different than the decision boundary for the majority. So it's really, really important to consider this when training such systems. And this problem of favoring the majority group while discriminating against the minority group is not just a theoretical scientific question, it's an actual practical problem. Machine learning systems are not just used to help people make medical diagnosis or to recommend music, they're also used in the justice system. So in the United States, there's this notorious algorithm called COMPASS, and the goal of the system is to predict whether a person will relapse, that is, whether somebody who committed a crime will commit another crime or not. And the system basically takes a lot of information about a person and then makes a prediction. And this prediction is on a scale from 1, so that person is harmless, won't commit another crime, to 10. That is, the person is highly dangerous. So we have two people here. The VP, by his initial, is the person on the left, uh, who has previous convictions of two armed robberies and one attempted robbery. And we have the person on the right, whose criminal record is four administrative offenses under juvenile criminal law. So she did very small things while she was young. And here's the prediction by the system whether the person can be released, go back to the family, be back to society, or not whether the person has to stay in prison. And we see that the person on the left, the VP, uh, is considered low risk, while the person on the right is considered to be high risk. Now, there's a group of journalists at ProPublica who wrote this very nice article called Machine Bias, and I highly recommend you to read it, in which they showed that the prediction of the system are very bad and actually systematically discriminating against people of color. So what they found is that in the cases they looked at, people like BB, the person on the right, doesn't commit a crime, while the people with low risk on the left, they commit a crime right after they get released. And what's special here again is that the system is systematically discriminating against African Americans. So there's a bias, a distortion against black people. And in statistics, as I showed you, we have this distinction between the false positives, the error type 1, and the false negatives, the error type 2. So our hypothesis in this context would be that the offender does not relapse. That's the null hypothesis. So False positive would be to classify somebody as high risk who's actually not relapsing, who's not committing another crime. And what they found is that the, that the probability that white people will become victims of this error is 23.5%, and the probability for African Americans to be subject to this error is 44.9%. And Surprisingly, the error in the other direction is also in favor of whites. So here we have a situation that people are classified as low risk of relapsing, but they actually do relapse. So here the probabilities are reversed. So whites are far more likely to be released even though they will relapse, and African Americans are not so likely to be victims.
What's also important to consider here is that this compass system is a commercial product without the possibility to audit it, because everything is a trade secret. Overall, ProPublica showed that the predictions of Compass in reality are only correct 60% of the time if you compare with the actual recidivism over two years. Now let's think a bit about why that happened. Let's just assume that these systems are built by competent programmers who've paid attention in their machine learning courses and who want to teach everything right. As you know, in machine learning we learn a mapping from X to Y. So we had information about the tissue sample, which is our X, and a diagnosis, which is our Y. Here we now have data about prisoners, that's our X, and the recidivism in these prisoners, which is the Y. And we're learning this connection. Now the problem is that the X that we have is not a sample of the population, but it's only the people the police caught. And that's a very important difference, because this can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. African Americans might just be checked more often, so they get more criminal offenses. And we find that also our why is not the actual why. Because it only refers to those who have been convicted by the legal system. For example, in a jury system like the one in the United States, this again can discriminate latently or less latent. And therefore, these techniques can become a kind of money laundering for prejudice, as much as Zagosti called it. Another problem is that these systems are presented as decision making aids. They're just tools that people can use. But the reality shows that people do rely on these systems. That is, they trust the discriminatory algorithm. Here's an example from a feature by the German radio station Deutschlandfunk called Algorithmen im US Justizsystem Schicksalsmaschinen von Tim Schimmick. And it's a very good example for how people trust in systems that are imperfect. So they talk to people like probation officer Veronica Hiller, uh, who evaluates cases, these criminal cases, and then recommends a decision and a sentence to a judge. And the surprising thing is that even though she's been on duty for a quarter of a century, she really likes the system, even though I just showed you that it's really not that great in making the prediction. And I'm showing you this now to really give you a sensitivity that we're talking about socio-technical systems. So it's always people and technology. It's not only about machine learning and the algorithm, but it's also about the people who use the algorithm. Another important issue with machine learning is its public availability. It's very, very easy nowadays to train machine learning systems, as you've seen, right? It doesn't really take much. You just follow some simple instructions step by step, and then you train your own system. But of course, if you can train a system in only so, so few lines, then a lot of people end up training systems who probably don't know what kind of mistakes the systems make and what consequences the different errors have on the system. And I would like to show you now another example related to the prediction of crime. Um, there was a paper by researchers from Shanghai Jiutong University who claimed that they can predict criminals by just looking at ID photos. And it's a very, very nice use case on people who train the machine learning system, which looks good by the numbers. It looks very scientific, the paper. It looks like they've done everything right. But I'm now going to show you how it went wrong and why it's so problematic and why you really need to pay attention to the data that you're using and evaluate. So the authors wanted to predict whether a person is a criminal or not based on the face. That's already a bad idea. And we already know that the way a person looks has nothing to do with whether a person will commit a crime or not. Still, for the study, they took 1,800 photos of Chinese adult male between the age of 18 and 55 and tried to predict whether somebody is a criminal or not. All the people had no facial hair, no beard, 
They had no scars and no visible tattoos. So they took 700 photos of convicted criminals and these pictures were provided by the police and they have 1,100 photos from various sources on the internet which they call normal system. So each of the rows that we have here corresponds to the different categories. One is the normal citizens, the, the non-criminals, and the other one is the criminals. And I'd like to do a quick experiment with you, so please stop the video, look at it, and then think, make a decision which you think is the criminals. So please pause the video and make a decision whether you think the person is a criminal or not. So here's the solution. The people on the bottom are not criminals, where, while the people on top were actually criminals according to the input data that they had. Now, you probably got this right, but the question is why? How can we actually tell that just based on that photo? Now, the solution is quite simple. So there's some really important subtle differences between the photos. First and foremost, a lot of the people on the bottom, they have a white color. Then you can see people smiling a bit. So you, so you can see here people under quite harsh lighting, very unfortunate lighting, and with very rough skin, whereas on the bottom they have quite soft skin. And the reason for that is that they probably photoshopped pictures, because what we have here is we have the pictures that the police took, and it's a certain type of picture with a certain lighting and a certain face expression. We have the pictures on the bottom, which are from applicants on a, a job portal like LinkedIn. So these are professional pictures. They're probably Photoshop. It's a whole different picture. And the machine learning system is really good at picking up on this. And this is a particularly strong example of the so-called sampling bias, in which a certain group is represented differently. And such biases can occur randomly. For instance, if too few data points are available to make reliable statements. And we can often see such problems in medical studies where testing is expensive and time consuming. Then there's the, which is the problem with the lack of amount of data. Then there's the reporting bias, which describes when respondents make incorrect statements for instance, when they're questioned about a violent crime where fear plays a role or repression plays a role. And then there's, of course, the selected features that describe a problem. And that can also influence the modeling quite significantly. Let's consider this connection between the bias in the data and the bias in the model. And you can see that both can influence the other. In machine learning, we basically have two forms of bias. On the one hand, we have bias in the data, like I showed you with the crime example, where the policeman might just stop people more often, or people in the jury might be racist. So learning from historical data is really reproducing history to some extent. And on the other hand, we have the modeling bias, which means that all the decisions that we make as engineers when training the systems have an impact on what predictions we make. So let's consider the machine learning pipeline in practice in its roughest form. We have the challenging problem of collecting representative data, and that must be pre-processed under certain circumstances. And as we've seen, the collection of truly representative data is not always possible and there's many, many reasons for that. But this pre-processed data is then used as the basis of our model, which means that errors or inadequacy in the first part, they can also influence the second part. And sometimes through the modeling, you can reduce these errors, but that's not automatic and you really need to be thoughtful on that. And as we said and seen before, these systems are then interpreted and manipulated by the users. And we really can't ignore this human component in the system. Like the data and the model, they're part of the overall socio-technical system. And under certain circumstances, they really can influence the collection of new data, 
which then in effect turns the model and so on. So we have these feedback loops here. But let's consider the collection of representative data in more detail first. So what you probably don't know is that when self-driving cars are trained, a lot of simulations are used. And that makes a lot of sense because car crashes are really dangerous and super expensive. So we try to simulate them because it's far too expensive to really, really try it out for real. But simulations are not reality because in a simulation, you have to model everything. You have to model gravity, you have to model the light conditions and simulate how the whole material uses. Nevertheless, state-of-the-art self-driving cars have been using data from games like Grand Theft Auto. Now, it's quite a reasonable idea to use a simulator in a very advanced computer game to train a system, but really think of all the limitations and all the things that you're not actually modeling with the system. There's also some problems with the modeling that I'd like to consider. So the idea of this no free lunch theorem that we've looked at before is that if you look at all possible situations, no model works better than all others. We make assumptions and these assumptions have consequences our model and they really limit our model. And it's in a way our job as data scientists to name the limiting cases and to make clear what different applications the system can be used for. This is your responsibility to think of where does this work and where it doesn't and what are the error cases. And again, these assumptions about the scenario and the simplifications, they are our modeling bias, which fails in certain situations. Let's consider some examples for such modeling biases. So here's a sort of famous example for modeling decisions that make a difference. So here we have a system that's translating from German to Turkish and back. And if we have a sentence like, she is a woman, point, she is a doctor, and we translate it back, then in German it ends up, she is a woman, he is a doctor. The core problem here is that Turkish is a gender neutral language, so it does not indicate the gender in the language. So that means if you just have the sentence, ubi doctor, it will just look at the most likely German translation. And if the system has seen more male doctors in the data set than female doctors, so it has seen the sentence, he is a doctor more often than she is a doctor, they will most likely produce the translation. But, and I can illustrate this now with another example, this is also due to an important modeling decision. As you can see, if you turn everything into one sentence, so you just replace the dot with a comma, she is a woman and she is a doctor, then the translation is correct. And what you see here is that these biases can also be a result of the modeling decision. Since we modeled our translation based on sentences and not paragraphs or the whole text, we were prone to make these gender biases in our translation. So an important thing in machine learning is to define what we consider a success. Our objectives here are always based on assumptions. The problem here, for instance, could be the accuracy of the translation. And the question is, do we model it on a word-by-word -word level? Do we model it on a sentence-by-sentence -sentence level or paragraph-by-paragraph -paragraph level? What do we do about synonyms? And what is a good translation for us? So how do we measure what is a right translation? And how can we be sure that the system actually picks up enough context? And there's another really important problem with machine learning system that are the so-called adversarial attacks, that's attacks by enemies. So here we have a system, and let's imagine that the system tries to predict different traffic signs. So for the examples here on the bottom, on the top left, we're quite good at making the decisions, right? This is very far from the decision boundary, which means that we can make good decisions about which of the traffic signs it is. Here, we're not so sure, right? We're more prone to errors. You see there's also a lot of blue dots close to the decision boundary 
of the red dots. So with adversarial examples, what's happening is that somebody sneaks in and changes certain new data points so cleverly that they're actually being wrongly classified. So if you can do small changes to a stop sign, um, which then make a self-driving car not stop, then this can have disastrous consequences for the people in the car. And this is really puzzling and quite a fundamental problem in machine learning. So you have a system that works for thousands of examples of traffic signs, but then it breaks in crucial ways. So let's quickly consider what fair learning is. So what does it take to build a fair model? And what are the principles that we really have to think about? Let's consider this example. We have a sensitive attribute A. We have certain data points and we have our prediction of the model based on the data points and the sensitive um, attribute. Now, independence is an important principle here um, and it's also quite intuitive. So let's consider an example. Here we have an insurance company that wants to decide, given an applicant file X, that's information about a person, how much contribution C should be paid. And, and this is important, the result should be independent of the age of the applicant. So let's consider car insurance. You want to not discriminate people by age in terms of the insurance. So you want C to be orthogonal to A so that the probability of two people is not dependent on the attribute A. And that's how you formally achieve that. And it's not enough to just hide the date of birth because it's still quite easy to estimate the age of a person based on a variety of other factors. You can, for instance, estimate the age of a person based on whether or not they have a family, what their job is, at what career level they are, how many children they have, what age the children are. So just leaving out the date of birth is not enough. And the head of Vector Institute in Toronto, Richard Zemel, suggests the following. So you learn a representation Z, which is based on the data X, and the sensitive attribute A, which was the H. So then you regulate this representation so it does not contain any information about the sensitive attribute, but so that it still can make predictions about the thing that you're trying to predict. And that's basically expressed here. So you still want to make the prediction. But there are aspects of fairness that are not covered by this model. It still follows a majority rule. So if some groups are much more strongly represented in the data, it will still make better predictions for that or still might be affected by that. And this leads to the second criteria that we want to consider, and that's separation. So the goal of separation is to find a model that consistently provides good predictions for the concept C, regardless of group affiliation in the sensitive attribute A. So the predicted contribution should be determined with the same precision according to target phi for all age groups, and that's what we're trying to say here in the equation. And again, the question is, how do we do this? It is possible to value groups more strongly in the error analysis. And this has the same effect as having more data points. So you really just, in the evaluation metrics, look more closely on the underrepresented groups. And that's one solution and one important solution. Another criterion that we want to look at is the so-called sufficiency. And that, in a way, formalizes the idea of equality of result. So, for example, in each age group A equals A, the same number of people in percent should receive an insurance commitment. That's, again, formally expressed on the bottom. And what we really want to ensure here is that we calibrate our predictions so that each group gets the same result. 
So I now discussed three different concepts of fairness that fight very different problems. What's interesting is that in general, these three conditions are mutually exclusive. This can even be shown mathematically, which means that you can't reach all the properties at the same time. This relates to the whole topic of uncertainty estimation, which means knowing when you know nothing. So if you consider the example of traffic signs again, then you want to have a way for the machine learning model to be able to express the uncertainty about the decision, especially when it's acting far away from the training data that it has. And that's quite active research. It's very, very exciting. So an important takeaway of this lecture is to consider that these systems are mostly based on correlation. They're not capturing causality. They're not even modeling causality. There is causality research, but it's really only in its infancy. And correlations at this point in time is the best we've got, but we have to build all these systems, understanding these limitations. Now, what do we do now? I mean, I showed you now these principles, and I hope you try to adhere to these principles. So, one important thing that you should consider is that you have to make the optimization goals of your systems transparent. Ideally, such systems should provide tools so that people can actually influence the goals. And I think, so some people are even demanding something called an algorithm TÜV, which means Technical Inspection Association for Machine Learning Systems or algorithms. I think it's a nice metaphor, but I find it problematic because the consequences of algorithms and artificial intelligence are very profound. And it's very different than not knowing how your motor in your car works than not knowing how the news that you see are actually selected. Because these techniques, these machine learning techniques, are so powerful and ubiquitous, I believe that everybody needs a basic understanding of what they can and can't do. And I know from your self-assessment videos that you have a strong interest in human-computer interaction. And therefore, I want to highlight also this idea that we do not only need scientists that make algorithms 5% faster or 2% more accurate. We also really need people who understand the technical side deeply but who also know the user side and bring these things together and make machine learning systems meaningful to users.